The ogive, or the ogival arch, is the pointed arch that characterises Gothic. And although we see the pointed geometry in earlier Romanesque decoration, and variations of the pointed arch are found throughout the Middle East, the Gothic style of architecture springs out of Europe during the 1100s, seemingly from nowhere. Not just the pointed arch, but the whole stylistic package, with no transitory predecessor. Materialising spontaneously across Europe and the Christian West in the Middle Ages, was Gothic really just a mere stylistic fashion? Just a new decorative formula? Or was it something else? How did architects, stonemasons and sculptors know how to execute this style all over the continent to such a high standard and to such a consistency and all within a similar time frame? Or were they secretly trained to build in this form? silently waiting in the shadows, ready to unleash Gothic once the order was given. The Gothic style of architecture holds a great secret, but something is missing that prevents us understanding it. A piece of the puzzle, misplaced and absent, it has been hidden, or was always hidden. Chartres Cathedral, the site of a mound, and the subsequent cathedral built upon it. Chartres has always been one of the most sought-after places of pilgrimage in France. Christians would journey far and wide, but before that the Gauls went there in crowds, and still earlier the whole Celtic world. The etymological root of the word Chartres has been traced by scholars to the word Carnutes. The Carnutes were a Gallic tribe which formed part of the larger Gaul civilization that occupied mainland Europe. The Gauls were Celtic peoples and followed an ancient Celtic religion, overseen by religious leaders or high priests known as the Druids. Before France was France, it was Gaul. As scholar Jean Marcal writes, According to Caesar, this Carnute territory was considered the center of Gaul and it was home to the great sanctuary, where all the Druids of Gaul would gather once a year. All traditions, including Caesar's historical testimony, agree that the land of the Carnutes was a huge forest. Therefore, this sacred sanctuary would have formed a nimitan, meaning a clearing in the middle of the forest. Historian of Chartres Cathedral, Suchet, writes, It stands at the highest part of town, on an elevation where, according to our ancient records, there was once a sacred wood in which the Druids gathered to make their sacrifices and devotions, could very well have been an omphalos, a symbolic center of the world. This is a dolmen. Archaeologists and historians inform us that many were previously covered with earth to form what is commonly understood as a mound. This has led many to conclude that dolmens were burial chambers, or megalithic tombs. Louis Charpentier, however, has a different conclusion. The French have a very special connection with their Gothic and medieval past. Charpentier is another in a long line of French writers that have spoken on the esoteric side of Gothic. As Charpentier claims, the Celtic megalithic stones the dolmens, the menhirs, etc., were placed in very specific locations that mark significant areas where the wuvir was present. Wuvir is a very old Gaulish word, and it signifies the snake, the serpents that glide on the ground, and, by extension, to rivers that snake, and to currents that snake through the ground. Today we call these serpents telluric currents. They are often represented in mythology as winged serpents, sirens, or dragons. The Gothic has always eluded attempts to fix its origin. It appears suddenly, without preamble, towards 1130s. In a few years, it reaches its apogee, born whole and entire without experiment or miscarriage. The Gothic appears at one blow, complete 
whole, and throughout the West. One can hardly believe, writes Regine Pernaud, that such a development, at the same time so vigorous and so swift, can have been due to a new decorative formula. In Notre Dame de Paris, Victor Hugo tells us that before the Renaissance and the rise of the printing press, architecture functioned as a principal type of language. Our ancestors wrote their stories in stone, with carvings. Years later, in 1922, another enigmatic Frenchman, Falconelli, told us that the cathedrals were encoded with a secret language, an argotique. Argotique is a play on the word argo, as reference to slang, or as a language particular to all individuals who have an interest in communicating their thoughts to each other without being understood by those around them. It is also a reference to the Argonauts, who sailed the Argo ship, spoke the Argo language. Argotique is primitively a secret, cabalistic, alchemical language, a system of communication that only the initiated or the adept can decipher. And this language refers to alchemy and what is known as the Great Work. And if this is correct, that the Gothic cathedrals carry encoded or encrypted instructions relating to alchemy, then that means that those who built them knew exactly what they were doing. That Gothic did not arise as an architectural style, but as a mode to deliver a message, and perhaps even to perform a function. But how to read this secret language? All cryptograms require a cipher, or key, in order to be deciphered or decoded. The problem is finding the right key. Doors, however, are not opened without a key, nor without a key word. One has to look for them. Not only is Chartres Cathedral one of the greatest masterpieces of Gothic architecture, it is also one of the best preserved. It is a Pandora's box of enigmas that, if opened, lead the curious down many different avenues of investigation. The cathedral's secrets abound. On the summer solstice at precisely midday, a ray of sunlight comes through a small space in the stained glass window, named in honour of Saint Apollinaire, and strikes a particular stone in the transept. As Louis Charpenter writes, Someone, at some time in the past, had taken the trouble to leave an empty space, minute perhaps, in a stained glass window. Someone else had taken the trouble to pick out a particular flagstone, different from the rest of those which constitute the floor of the cathedral. A concerted attention was at the bottom of this. Stonemason and Glazer obeyed an order. It was given them by an astronomer. Another riddle is found in the cold, darkened northern section of the cathedral. During the great Christian era, in the Middle Ages, pilgrims would journey far and wide to visit Chartres. Once at the cathedral, they went in procession by a passage on the north side, which leads to the crypt to visit a grotto underneath the church, where the sacred statue was to be seen. This statue was the Our Lady of Under the Earth, or the Black Virgin, or Black Madonna. A figure steeped in high mystery, carved in the hollowed out trunk of a pear tree and very ancient, representing the Holy Virgin, seated with the infant God on her knees. Age had blackened it, for it was made not by Christians, but before the birth of this savior by druids, pagan priest to whom a prophetic angel announced that a virgin would give birth to a god. When Christians first came to Chartres, they found her in the druid grotto. The original statue is no longer and has been replaced with a replica. It has also been moved. During the Middle Ages, the cathedral and its crypt have been built over the original grotto. This grotto, Sharpenter claims, is a Celtic or Druidic dolmen, or dolmenic chamber. To lure currents or natural electrical phenomena in the earth or its bodies of water, scientists have located 32 distinct mechanisms that cause earth electricity. One of the primary causes is said to be due to the interaction between solar wind and the ionosphere. These interactions above result in geomagnetic anomalies, which induce the telluric currents in the ground. 
The telluric currents flow in the surface layers of the Earth, and scientists can use them to explore underground structures for mining exploration, petroleum exploration, mapping of fault zones, monitoring tectonic plates, and magma chambers. The telluric currents are present in groundwater, and the ionized water's interaction with rock ore produces a unique phenomena. As ionically charged fluids travel in porous rock, an electrical current is created by the motion of the suspended ions. This electrical chemical effect found in the ore bodies is akin to commercial electrochemical batteries in magnitude. Patents have been developed with the intention of harnessing this form of telluric current electricity. As early as the 1840s, Scientists were experimenting with earth batteries in Hyde Park by immersing metal wires in moist soil or water from the earth. They found that the moist earth established an electric current, which was used in the development of the telegraph systems. The simplest and first thing to do, Sharpinter writes, was evidently to trace these currents to their source. In earth herself, in the cavern, where there was no cavern, or if it was unsuitable, they made an artificial one. For the Celts was a dolmenic chamber, for the Christians a crypt. The dolmen, or later crypt, was required, he writes, because it exemplified the high secret of the musical stone. The stone under tension. As we see with the dolmen, the table, submitted to two contrary forces, its cohesiveness and its weight, is thus in a state of tension and is susceptible of vibration like the stretch piano string. It is at the same time an accumulator and an amplifier. The potency of the telluric wave attains its maximum force in the dolmenic chamber, which acts like a resonant drum. And this is central to the functioning of the dolmenic chamber, and why dolmens were found in mounds. Dolmens would not work as well, according to Sharpenter, unless they were buried within the earth. Byzantines and the Romans constructed, above ground, a resonance chamber. The original cave, utilising cupola and concave vault. But such a vault, static, heavy, but without tension, is incapable of vibration. These kind of resonant chambers are not the same, because they are above ground. Victor Hugo alludes to this in Notre Dame de Paris, when he states... In the Middle Ages, once a building was completed, there was almost as much of it in the ground as outside. In cathedrals, it was, as it were, another cathedral underground, low, dark, mysterious. These mighty buildings, whose method of formation did not simply have foundations, but so to speak, roots. Thus churches, palaces, fortresses had earth up to their waists. Medieval cathedrals were deliberately buried, perhaps as resonant dolmenic chambers, their lower halves like roots connected with the telluric earth below. The word cathedral is very similar to the word cathode. The root of kath stems from the Greek kata, which means down, and the Hittite katan, meaning below, underneath. Furthermore, a cathode stems from the Greek kathodos, which means descent or way down. If there is any significance in the word cathedral and its relationship to electricity, then it likely relates to something that is coming from underneath, i.e. the telluric currents. Perhaps this is the reason why the mound at Chartres was selected as high importance by the Celtic Druids, because it provided the right geography for a buried Dolmenic chamber. And this chamber was later integrated into and recalibrated as the Christian crypt of Chartres Cathedral, resting place of the Black Virgin. And it wasn't just Our Lady of Under the Earth, the Black Virgin, that Christian pilgrims travelled far to honour. It was also to asperge themselves with the living waters, which come from a well which opens in the crypt. The well of Chartres seems to have had special importance either because its water had special qualities, or because it was thought to exercise magical power. It is 33 meters deep, and the water table lies about 30 meters beneath the crypt. Recent topographical readings show that the bottom of the well is located a little bit below the level of the Ear River. 33 Masonic meters deep, or 108 feet. From the floor of the choir above the crypt, it is 37 meters to the bottom of the well. 
and it is another 37 meters from the choir floor to its ceiling. Chartres Cathedral is a mathematical masterpiece. And just like the motif of the Virgin giving birth to an infant, the special and holy emphasis on water traces back to Celtic origin. The Dominic arrangements always included a well of this kind. The Druids practiced a form of water baptism, which is classic in every ritual of initiation. A holy well, much like this one, where the living waters from deep within the earth usher forth into a Dolmenic chamber, a Celtic tradition and practice that was later absorbed and integrated into Christianity. And it may have been this Celtic tradition that led to the development of the Gothic form in the first place. As Charpentier explains, It is necessary that one regards the cathedral as a musical instrument, designed to amplify waves that have some sort of relationship with the underground current of water. For the cathedral is a musical instrument that makes use of resonance. This is certainly why its principal part is the emptiness, which constitutes its sound box. All the master craftsmen's art and science went to the tuning with this emptiness, in quality, volume, and tension of the stone that gives it dimension. In the dolmen, the edifice is connected with the water through the well that existed originally at the level of the choir in every cathedral. The existence of a well, originally at the level of the choir in every cathedral, appears important. The Romanesque cathedrals were all upgraded during the 12th and 13th centuries with Gothic choirs in the east. Perhaps this is why, an upgrade to their stone musical instruments. But perhaps Charpentier is just another enigmatic French writer in our history. What about the actual evidence? The well in the crypt of Chartres is not the only one. Countless medieval holy sites have a history connecting them to wells and water. Various scholars have explored the role of resonant cavities in the history of architectural acoustics. And it is no mystery that the history of the cathedral is inextricably linked with the music of the choir, the organ, and the bells. There is also evidence of stone acting in an amplifying manner upon sound. Can you hear me? Yes. You can. What on earth? This is a key. It's difficult to explain and capture this phenomenon on film, but the hollowed out cavity that runs from one end of the arch to the other is able to amplify a whisper to an audible level. One person sits at one end of the arch and another at the other end, and you whisper to each other. The arch carries a sound and amplifies it to such a degree that it sounds as if the opposite person was standing right next to you. Anyone can test this for themselves at Liverpool Cathedral, and it makes you wonder just what influence grander arches such as this have upon sound quality and structure. And it's not just Liverpool. Gloucester Cathedral features a whispering gallery above its choir, which amplifies the whispers of those standing at the other end. Liverpool Cathedral was completed in 1978, one of the first real cathedrals erected in England since the Reformation in the 16th century. Following the Industrial Revolution, where templated machine-cut stone and artificial pseudo-stone were used en masse to erect countless imitations of the medieval, ogival form, we see an emphasis on building a cathedral that honoured, as close to possible in the modern world, the traditional method of medieval stonemasonry. The cathedral sits upon St. James's Mount, a mound with significant elevation in the city, just like Chartres. This site was used as a stone quarry since at least the 16th century. It was later transformed into a cemetery. Ramps led to arcades that were used as catacombs. The new classical style of the site is very much of the 1700s, and in 1773, 
As quarrying progressed, they discovered a spring at the site. It wasn't long before people started claiming that the water was helping their ailments and making them feel good. What's more curious is that the west section of Liverpool Cathedral, which forms the nave, is also called the well. There are no documents of a well ever existing in this location, but there are tunnels that run directly below this portion of the cathedral. In his book, Peter Canarly writes, Preparation of the foundations for the west front was hampered by the presence underground of an old collapsed tunnel, which had been excavated in the 18th century to give access to the quarry. The tunnel entrance has been bricked up, and currently, it is not known where this tunnel leads. Charpenter claims that the ancients, including Christians, took to establish their cult sites over points that were tellurically potent. Notre Dame, Chartres, Mont Saint-Michel and hundreds of other medieval structures were built over former pagan sites. Perhaps Liverpool Cathedral exists on an ancient Celtic site. All the signs are there, and in light of that assumption, the decision to construct the cathedral from real stone, and with traditional stone masonry techniques, makes sense. For the dolmens were stone. We know through cymatics that sound and vibration has a profound effect on water. But how do telluric currents enter the equation? We know they are present underground and in water. It's as if all the pieces of the puzzle were there waiting to be connected, but we're missing another key. Sharpenter claims that patients were looked after in the bosom of Earth herself, close to the Dolmenic chamber, with water from the well. The really ill, the paralytics above all, were healed there. The water was also efficacious for wounds. He also claims that when the Wuvir was in pulsation, men were often visited by the Great Illumination. Could the living waters actually have held healing properties, or the ability to transform one spiritually? There does exist an abundance of anecdotal evidence, suggesting that well water has healing properties. There are histories documenting well women and the veneration of wells. There is also scientific evidence detailing the beneficial properties of ionized water for human consumption and its positive impact on plant growth. Have you ever noticed that in many medieval cathedral grounds, the most magnificent trees grow? But while the common people may have consumed well water, there is no evidence that they understood the relationship between the water and the telluric currents. There is also no evidence that these currents were ever harnessed to produce some kind of free energy for public use. If water, sound and the telluric currents ever functioned together to produce an outcome beyond beneficial water consumption and baptism, then there is far more evidence that it has always remained occulted or hidden knowledge, and a practice of the initiated or adept as belonging to the workings of the Masonic alchemists, and not accessible by the majority. A dolmen is made from stone, and for the alchemist, accomplishing the great work means creating the philosopher's stone. What if Hugo's, Falconelli's, and Charpenter's enigmatic words are suggestive of something bigger? Consider this passage from Victor Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris, in which a character contemplates one of Notre Dame's carved bas-reliefs. He had been busy studying the bas-relief of the main doorway which represents, according to some, Abraham's sacrifice. According to others, the alchemist's process. Portraying the sun by the angel, the fire by the faggots, the operator by Abraham. Almost a hundred years before Falconelli told us that the stone carvings of the cathedrals were encoded with a secret argotique, a secret language that only the adept could read. Hugo describes this hidden language perfectly. What we see in this passage is two simultaneous interpretations of stone carving and its message. The Christian story of Abraham's sacrifice on the surface, but then another story underneath, one of an alchemist or an operator working with fire 
and the sun. And just like the way the Christian crypt recalibrated and repurposed the older Dolmenic chamber, it appears that Abraham's story here is a recalibration of an older or unspoken message that was left for the adept to interpret. Perhaps he initiated those shadowy, vague figures that appear in the history books throughout the centuries, selected the site for Liverpool Cathedral, and gave instructions to create it in the traditional medieval form. Could all cathedrals contain hidden messages like this? Or is it just certain cathedrals? The task at hand is a tricky one. To find other examples of Argotique, and to try and work out whether there was indeed a connection between sound, water, and the telluric currents. And the first step is to differentiate between legitimate, occult cathedrals like Chartres, and the counterfeit copies that exist in their thousands and are purely stylistic. But at least we now have a criteria to work with when investigating. One, are they carved from real stone in the traditional way? Two, do they have a significant underground chamber? And three, are they located near water or upon an older, more ancient site? Why did the Gothic style appear all over Europe at the same time? Did someone give an order? And who built them? They left their marks in stone, but not much else is known apart from some clues. And what is the significance of the Holy Virgin in the crypt? No doubt you've heard of the Knights Templar, but what about the man responsible for creating them? Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, a leading member of the Cistercians, and who some maintain was the last druid in the West. He also had a special, cult-like devotion to the Virgin Mary, Virgini Paraturi, the Black Virgin. 